work in progress. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is Eleanor Rangers, the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. And uh, as per usual, I will have a couple of introductory remarks and then we'll introduce our guest speaker for this evening. So this is, as always, the History in Our Backyard webinar series, uh, formerly a live event, but now a webinar, hopefully in the future. Uh, we will be able to go back to some limited live programming, so please stay tuned for that. Um, and that is, of course, contingent on the local coronavirus uh, transmission issues in the Bucks County community. So um, as I was talking with one of the attendees this evening, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to restart some limited programming, uh, perhaps in the spring, but uh, stay tuned for announcements regarding that. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that uh, for those of you hard local to the Warminster area, um, the Fuge, where we traditionally held our programming, actually is in the process of opening up a brewery and pub. So um, I believe that they are slowly inching forward with preparing that space. And uh, I know that's coming soon. I'm hoping before, uh, before March. So stay tuned for that. And uh, I think that's going to be a great, uh, a great place that uh, for that part of um, the Warminster area is definitely something that's uh, sorely needed. So uh, more to come on that. Um, and uh, I did want, of course, make the usual plug as a modest 501c3 organization. Donations are always welcome for our organization. Um, that supports you know, guest lecturers if they're live coming from out of town. Transcriptions of our interviews as part of our uh, ongoing uh, historical archive. When we were doing things live, displays at some time at some periods of time were developed and that can help to defray costs of that and also some modest costs that are required for uh, maintenance of our website coldwarhistory.org. Um, I just wanted to also remind everyone I am using a new email system for sending out group emails to announce programming. You've probably seen a new format for those that's actually uh, through a system called MailChimp that I had to aggregate um, actually the email, uh, my email distribution list yes, so, that, really so that Outlook did not yeah. think that that was a, uh, was, was, was spam. Um, just a reminder to everyone, yeah. if you could please mute yourselves. Um, I would, would definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up to that. If you are, if you were receiving notifications from us and you are not receiving them, please let me know. Um, you can send an email at mail at coldwarhistory.org and I can check into that. But you can also get information on our programming through our website, coldwarhistory.org. I also maintain a Facebook page uh, as well uh, under the same name, although it, uh, the abbreviation PA is used instead of the full Pennsylvania for that name on Facebook. Um, we also do archive these webinars um, and they are available on demand on our YouTube channel. I do try to keep that channel updated with other videos um, periodically as well. So it's always worth checking back, you know, periodically to see what's new up there. Recently, we actually had an intake of some uh, videos from a gentleman who had worked in the TV studio at the old Naval Air Development Center. And we've been able to digitize a number of very interesting um, old videos uh, from what we had received from, from this gentleman. I actually have another batch that needs to go up. So we will be updating those uh, fairly soon in the next couple of days. So uh, just, you know, just an example of how we are constantly trying to keep the site uh, fresh. As I mentioned, we do have a, a Facebook page and notice again, the name is Southeastern PA. So the abbreviation Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. I also just also want to, whoops, want to remind folks that we do have another website that we started uh, actually going on two years ago called the Southeastern Pennsylvania Veterans Virtual Wall of Honor Project. Um, if you have, if you are a veteran uh, from the Southeastern Pennsylvania area, or if you have family members that uh, even those that may have passed, we'd love to have you add their bio to our website. Uh, so would definitely encourage you to check that out uh, and submit a bio if so desired. A uh, couple other sister organization uh, 
programs that I want to mention as well. Because believe it or not, there aren't that many Cold War uh, historical societies out there. We are one of the few, actually. Uh, so we own, we own that distinction. But uh, the Cold War Museum, which is located in Virginia, also has webinars, usually once a month. And uh, if you want to get on their email distribution list, you can see the email there. You can uh, email Jason Hall. Their programs, they do charge $20 um, for their webinars. Um, and uh, but they are great. I mean, they have some very interesting topics um, and uh, I would definitely encourage you to check them out. This is the next one they just announced coming up at the end of February. Um, that uh, just an example of the type of program that they do and it's uh, fairly unique and, and distinct. So I would encourage you to check them out if you're interested. Um, also, there are a couple podcasts out there uh, that you may have interest in listening to. Um, this is one of them, Cold War po Conversations. They're run out of the UK. In fact, our guest speaker this evening uh, was recently interviewed for this uh, particular podcast. So would encourage you to check that out as well as um, the Cold War Vault. I believe uh, someone who attended last month's lecture um, may have meant, had actually mentioned this um, as well. So definitely would encourage you to check these out uh, uh, as if you are desiring additional Cold War uh, themed programming. Um, I also want to announce just one other slight update to our 2022 programming. Uh, we actually just added our December speaker, a gentleman by the name of Scott Sherrick, who I recently made the acquaintance of. Uh, he actually served in the Takamo mission when he was in the Navy uh, several years ago. Um, so uh, he is going to be making a presentation about Takamo. Um, so more to come on that. I think that's gonna be a fascinating uh, topic. And actually, for those of you who may not know, Naval Air Development Center from Warminster did have uh, quite a large role um, with uh, enabling technologies for Takamo. Um, and as a reminder um, for the webinar this evening, please kindly mute your microphones. And if you can also turn off your cameras for the presentation, that helps to preserve bandwidth. Uh, so, um, so we can definitely uh, not have any issues with, with transmission. So definitely appreciate that. And you can see I've actually put on the screen where you can locate on the Zoom platform where to mute your microphone and where to turn off your video. Those normally are located uh, in the lower uh, left-hand portion of your screen, or sometimes I think uh, on, la on um, iPads, they may be in the upper upper portion upper, of the screen, upper, but I just want to encourage you to please do that. All right. So again, if someone could, I think someone needs to mute their microphone. <laughs> Not sure who is live. All right, thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and introduce our guest speaker this evening, Don Smith. Um, Don is a retired Army Reserve officer who served in Germany from 1986 to 1989, so right before the wall came down. He visited Berlin East and West three times. And on one of those trips, he saw Stein Stucken and never forgot it. Um, he has been published in Military History Magazine, World War II Magazine, and the U.S. Army Intelligence Center's Military Intelligence <laughs> Bulletin. And this evening, um, Don is going to be regaling us with the story of Stein Stucken. And I will also let you know that he has published uh, a book uh, on this. Uh, it just actually got released. It is available uh, for purchase on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other major booksellers. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Don and we're gonna do the switcheroo on the uh, on our slide sharing. All right, so Don, the, pl the platform is yours. Okay, hold on a second. And thanks everyone for muting and turning off the cameras, which I will be doing myself. Hold on a second. All right, uh, the, right now I'm showing in slideshow mode. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, well, first off, uh, Eleanor and everybody at the Southeast Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society, thank you for this opportunity to come and talk to you about uh, Steinstucken. 
Uh, first, let me ask this question. How long should I talk for tonight, Eleanor? I think you're fine if it's 30 to 45 minutes. I usually like to leave about 10 or 15 for questions. Okay, all right. Okay, so for the next 30 to 40 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about one of the, one of the in my opinion, uh, a unique episode uh, in Cold War history. It arose from an extraordinary situation that occurred around uh, Cold War Berlin. And as a result of that extraordinary situation, lots of interesting things happened. And I decided to write a book about them. And so for the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, Steinstucken, the community, its Cold War experiences, and how that impacted uh, the American experience in Germany during the Cold War and also American policy during the Cold War. So let me go ahead and go on to the next slide here. All right, so what you're looking at here on the left-hand side of the screen and I'm highlighting it with my mouse here, is a Google Maps uh, depiction of the Steinstucken neighborhood. Steinstucken is part is, is a neighborhood uh, in, in, in Berlin, specifically in the southwest portion of the city. For those of you that are familiar with Berlin, it's in the Zeilendorf uh, borough that used to be part of the American occupation sector. And so this is Steinstucken here. And for those of you that follow German films, uh, or German uh, TV series like Generation War or Line of Separation, you might have heard of Babelsberg. Babelsberg is like Germany's Hollywood, and it is in the, it's uh, Steinstucken is basically a neighborhood of the Babelsberg area. So here's Steinstucken here, and I've outlined it, and I'm going to go ahead and hit this next tab here, and this shows you the boundary between Steinstucken, which is part of the city of Berlin, and the surrounding area belongs to the German state of Brandenburg. Now, you might say to yourself, that looks like kind of an odd border there. Well, if you look over in this map on the right-hand side, uh, this one, was, was, this one was, was created by the West Berlin government about the time that Steinstucken became a Cold War hotspot. I think you'll, you'll see uh, why Steinstucken was an extraordinary situation. This hatched line here that I'm highlighting, that shows the border between the American occupation sector of Berlin and the Soviet zone of Germany. And so here's Steinstucken, so you can see the unique shape of it, like an ax blade shape. So you can see the same shape here as you see over here. And you'll see that there's this road that goes from the Steinstucken neighborhood into Berlin, but you'll notice that that, that this Line, this hatch line here that denotes the boundary doesn't encompass the road. From 1945 until 1972, this road that connected Steinstucken to West Berlin didn't belong to West Berlin. It belonged to the state of Brandenburg. So what you had was you had a situation where a neighborhood that was part of the American occupation sector, the Americans were responsible for protecting that neighborhood for about 20, 25 years without the ability to drive to it or to walk to it. So when I said that we had an extraordinary situation to deal with here, that's it. Basically what we had is the Americans who were responsible for protecting uh, at least their portion of West Berlin and really all of West Berlin uh, because the Americans were the strongest Western power during the Cold War, had a, a area they were responsible for that they couldn't physically go to. Yet for 20 years, they managed to keep that neighborhood safe. And also the people in the neighborhood managed to live relatively normal lives. And that's really what the story of Steinstucken is about. Okay, so let me move on here. All right, so in the beginning of uh, the, in the years immediately after World War II ended, when the Americans, uh, British, uh, Russians, and later the French came in and occupied uh, uh, Berlin and, and set up a four power government of the city. Um, Steinstucken wasn't really on anyone's radar, at least on the Western uh, Allies side. And these maps demonstrate that. What you're looking at here is a, an Office of Strategic Services map that was generated in 1945 at about the time the Americans, British, and French moved in to start occupying the city of Berlin. The Americans moved in, the Western Allies moved into Berlin 
on 1st of July, 1945, and, and the Soviets, of course, had taken the city uh, two months before that. So four years later, this map was created by the American military government as we were in the process of transitioning from military to civilian government. So Steinstucken is actually out here, but you'll notice it doesn't show up on any maps out there. And for the first four or five years of the uh, American presence of Berlin, Steinstucken was pretty much forgotten. And I guess you can understand that because of all the turmoil that happened in Berlin from 1945 up to 1950, once you count coming back from the end of World War II, the beginnings of the Cold War, the neighborhood was pretty much forgotten. Well, that all changed on October 18, 1951, when the residents of Steinstucken found that their neighborhood had been surrounded by East German border guards their mailboxes had been broken open, and inside there were notices telling them that they were now officially part of the city of Potsdam, which is, in, which is southwest of Berlin, and the German state of Brandenburg. And why this was important is that this is a direct challenge by the, East German, by, by the East Germans, and also undoubtedly the Soviets, to American authority over a portion of the American sector of Berlin. So that was a challenge the Americans were faced with. All right. So... Steinstucken itself had, had less than 200 people in it. It was strategically insignificant. So, but the Americans ended up caring a lot about it. And the reason for that is not so much because of, of Steinstucken itself, but because of the impact that Steinstucken's loss would have on American relations with West Berlin and West Germany. So uh, at the very top of the slide, I've got an excerpt from a 1967 CIA report on the exclaves of West Berlin. And what exclaves are is they are sections of territory that officially belong to one government, but they are not connected to that government's territory. Like, for example, Steinstucken was not physically connected to the city of Berlin. And there were several plots like this around uh, West Berlin, around Berlin at the time areas that belong to West Berlin, but were completely surrounded by East German territory. Uh, and Steinstucken was the most significant one because the others were basic, basically farmer's fields or gardener's plots. They weren't fully inhabited. Steinstucken was the only one that actually had a community in it. And in the CIA report said basically that these, these plots were strategically insignificant, but they are significant namely because they provide the USSR with the ready means of testing Western resolve. So what were the Americans concerned about when they were figuring out how to deal with the Steinstucken crisis? First, they were concerned about the morale of West Berliners. Uh, in October of 1951, I'm sure we all remember the Berlin airlift, but by then, by October of 1951, it had been more than two years since the Berlin airlift had ended. And the pressure from the Soviets and the East Germans was continuing on West Berlin. And West Berliners were concerned that the United States might lose focus on West Berlin. I mean, during the Berlin airlift, that was our number one focus, supporting the people of Berlin. But by October of 1951, the Korean War has broken out. China has fallen to the communists. The Soviets have a nuclear bomb. And so... West Berliners were concerned that the United States might lose their desire to protect their community. They were also concerned that West Germany might start forgetting about West Berlin. Uh, West Germany was providing a lot of uh, economic support to keep the West Berlin economy going. And West Berliners were concerned that West Germans were just starting to think that maybe this Cold War was gonna go on for a long period of time and they should just start to disconnect themselves from West Berlin and write it off as lost. So the Americans were very concerned about West Berlin morale. Now, Amer West Berliners and West Germans at this time were concerned that a third world war might break out. And that was always a concern that uh, Cold War tensions might get hot. But something that, but, but in my research, it seemed that most everybody understood that was a worst case scenario, but not a lot of people really expected a war to break out at any particular time. West Germans, however, were concerned that if they supported the West, if they aligned themselves with the West in the Cold War, 
that might hinder the opportunity for East and West Germany to reunify. So remember, the Soviets are occupying Eastern Germany, the Americans, French and British are occupying West Germany, and many Germans want their countries to reunite and that's going to rely on Soviet cooperation in order for that to happen anytime soon. And the Soviets were putting out hints that they might be willing to support Germany reunifying as long as Germany stayed neutral. In other words, if Germany aligned itself with the United States, the Soviets were, not, were, were putting out uh, hints that they were not going to support uh, reunification. So that was a big challenge that the Americans had. The Americans were trying to get West Germany to align itself with NATO and with the United States in the Cold War. <clears throat> and many West Germans were concerned that if they did that openly, they might uh, shoot possibilities of reunification. Now, a lot of people might think that, yes, maybe the West Germans had their concerns, but maybe they really didn't have much leverage against the United States. I mean, the Soviet Union was right there on their border. They needed American support. Uh, what leverage did the West Germans really have? Well, the West Germans actually had a fair amount of leverage in, uh, in the fall of 1951. Remember, the Cold War, the Korean War is going on, <clears throat> NATO is trying to stand up, and many of the Western European nations are not providing a lot of good economic support to NATO. They're claiming that their economies are still, still devastated from the war, and they need to try to rebuild themselves. So the Americans are trying to get the West Germans who are, are now emerging as the strongest economic power in, West, in Western Europe to commit themselves to supporting the Western defense effort with industry, okay? So, so now we actually need the Germans to agree to do something for us. Some of you might've heard of something called the Schuman Plan. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, diplomatic initiatives going on in the early 1950s, trying to figure out ways to reintegrate Germany into Western Europe, but at the same time, reduce the threat that Germany posed to Western European peace. And one of the major uh, plans that came up for consideration was something called the Schuman Plan. It was uh, advanced by the French, uh, a French uh, a I think the foreign minister, Robert Schuman. And the idea was to create a international community, mostly of Western European nations, that would control all Western European coal and steel resources. Well, that was the official name of the plan, the official intent of the plan, but the real intent of the plan was to allow other countries to have some control over German and coal and steel resources, specifically those in the Ruhr, in the uh, northwestern part of the country. Well, you know, if you're German, you probably don't want to give up control over uh, some major national resources. And that was one of the things that the Americans were asking the Germans to consider to do, and they hadn't fully agreed to it yet in October of 1951. Okay, we'll skip past this one here. Uh, we've already talked about this. We were asked, the Americans wanted the, the West Germans to integrate themselves with the growing Western European community. And another thing that, 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 that some people forget, and I didn't realize until I started researching the story of Steinstucken, is that one month before the Steinstucken crisis in September of 1951, the Western uh, powers, the United States, UK, and France had announced that they were going to start discussions with Germany on ways to officially end the occupation. Germany was still officially occupied at this time because there was no peace treaty uh, uh, as a result of Potsdam, no peace treaty yet. So. But every, everybody in the Western side realized that West Germany, if it was gonna be a long-term partner, it had to be able to regain its status as a nation as opposed to an occupied country. Well, the problem is you normally, the way that you normally end a war is you have a treaty. Well, if, if the United States wanted to end World War II, it needed the Soviets cooperation to do that, which they weren't going to give. So they're looking for some alternate way to get Germany back into the community of nations, to end the occupation status. And what they came up with is something called the contractual agreements. And they were gonna basically, we were gonna basically conclude a series of contracts with the Germans. And that would govern things like basing of uh, Western troops in, uh, in uh, Germany, how much Germany would pay for reparations, what would Germany pay for the occupation. 
And Germany was going to be an equal part in these negotiations. And the Germans are good negotiators. And they also recognized that the Americans needed them. So that's a little background to explain why the Americans just couldn't blow off the West Germans and the West Berliners when it came to Steinstück. We needed their support. All right. So the next slide, the gentleman on the left is Ernst Reuter. He was the mayor of West Berlin during the uh, Berlin airlift crisis and also during the Steinstück crisis. Reuter was an international hero because he had rallied West Berliners to support the West and specifically the Americans during the Berlin airlift crisis. He was a hero in the United States. And so he was somebody that the Americans didn't want to anger. And Ernst Reuter got behind the cause of Steinstück. He made it very clear that this was a serious matter as far as the West Berliners and West Germans were concerned, and they would view this as a test of American resolve. The gentleman on the right is General Lemuel Mathewson. He was U.S. Commandant in Berlin at the time, and that statement over here on the, on the bottom left-hand corner is his explanation as to why, when he was reporting back to Washington to, to explain the situation he was in, he was explaining why Stein Stuckin was important. He came right out and said, it's strategically insignificant. There's no resources in there that we need in order to survive in Berlin. Stein Stuckin was basically a bedroom community. It didn't even have a gas station or a school. Uh, it was, again, a bedroom community. However, as, Matt, as Matthewson said, what had happened to Stein Stuckin, the fact that East Germans were trying to take it over, represented another encroachment by the Soviet Union on the territory of Greater Berlin and it weighs heavily on public opinion. And that was Matthewson's problem. So what Matthewson did is he decided to put his foot down. He played hardball with the Soviets and the East Germans. He announced that he was not gonna accept the takeover of Steinstücken. He made a big deal of it in the press. And then he waited to see what the Soviets were going to do. And the Soviets blinked. They came to uh, uh, the American Commandant's office they had a sit down with him, and they basically agreed to tell the East Germans to pull back from Steinstück. So unfortunately, General Matthewson didn't leave a diary, and a talk, his daughter is still alive. I interviewed her for the book. She said her father didn't keep any detailed records, so we just kind of have to try to, I've had to just try to piece together exactly how Matthewson approached the situation. But it appears that Matthewson decided to call the Soviets bluff and see how they would respond. And the Soviets backed down. And to celebrate, uh, this is a, a cartoon that showed up in a West Berlin newspaper. It was written by a prominent uh, uh, political cartoonist, Hans Bierbrauer. And so you see Matthewson, the German Jaeger, the hunter who has slain the Soviet uh, wolf. Uh, and Mima Mama Berlin is now picking up baby Steinstücken and the family is back together again. All right. So that was a big PR win for the United States, but what that did was that basically planted the American flag in Steinstücken, and now Steinstücken was an American responsibility. And again, American troops could not drive to Steinstücken. The West Police, Berlin police would, couldn't go there because uh, the East Germans and Soviet wouldn't permit it, but now America is responsible for it. So what happened is you then had in the 1950s, you had a decade where American diplomats intervened any time there was any harassment of the people in Steinstücken. And the people in Steinstücken would use this wooden path, this, this path through the woodlands to go through the forest, about a kilometer walk, to get into the city of Berlin, where they could then pick up the bus and go to their, their job. So uh, nobody really worked in Steinstücken. Everybody li lived in Steinstücken, and they worked or went to school in West Berlin. And throughout the 1950s, there were periodic harassments that the East Germans did of the people in Steinstücken. There would be times, for example, they would insist they had to get East Berlin identity cards, or they wouldn't let the um, they wouldn't let the coal companies come and deliver coal, or they wouldn't let uh, they wouldn't let the minister come and perform service. They blocked the mailman often from coming into uh, the, the village. The pictures that you're seeing here are from an incident that occurred in 1956 when Steinstücken's one major refrigerator went out. It was a relatively small community at the time, and the primary refrigerator that they used for storing milk for the people in the community went out, and the East Germans would not let a West Berlin repairman come in and fix it. So the gentleman that I'm pointing out here is Otto Sur. He was the governing mayor of Berlin, and he decided to make a big PR event of it. 
So what he did was he and a whole bunch of reporters, you see some of them there, went to the East German guard shack. Sewer said that he was the mayor of West Berlin and he wanted to go see his constituents in Steinstucken and he struck out. Uh, the East Germans would not let him in, although somehow later on the Soviets intervened and they did manage to get the refrigerator repaired. So you had all sorts of incidents occurring like this for the people of Steinstucken in the 1950s, but for the most part, they were able to live relatively normal lives. Uh, there was no wall around Steinstucken at the time. The East German police and the KGB and the, and the Soviets could have walked in at any time and taken anybody away, but they didn't. And that was something that the Americans watched very closely to make sure that there were no tensions that aggravated the East Germans or the, or the uh, Soviets to the point that they decided that they would want to snatch somebody in Steinstucken because the Americans were in no position to save them. Okay. All right. So here's another picture of, uh, of uh, West Berlin officials on one of the few times they were allowed to visit Steinstucken going through an East German border post. All right. Fast forward to the Berlin Wall crisis. When, the Berlin, when that crisis occurred, the East Germans surrounded Steinstucken with barbed wire. That, that led to this picture that you see here of this boy who for years had been playing with his neighbors uh, in Steinstucken. And this boy lived in a house that was outside of Steinstucken that was in uh, Brandenburg. So that was officially part of the GDR. And, and so this picture went worldwide because this, uh, this boy's friends in Steinstucken, just like all the people in Steinstucken who had had their neighbors right across the way for years, were now blocked off because of, because of the tensions that were going on. All right, so in September of 1961, President Kennedy sent this gentleman here. This is Lucius Clay. He was the military governor of, Gerlin, of Germany during the Berlin airlift. He was one of an, became an American hero uh, because of the Berlin airlift, and he was a hero to the Berliners. Kennedy knew that, so he wanted to. So he sent Clay back and told Clay to find a way, or, or sent Clay back to reassure the West Berliners. Well, Clay was a smart man. He realized that the West, the West Berliners respected him. Many of them revered him, and he realized that once he came back to Steinstucken, or once he came back to Berlin. The West Berliners would look for him to make some sort of statement, some sort of action to respond to the provocations that had gone on at the Berlin Wall. So when Clay arrived, he was told about the Steinstucken community. Well, he tried to drive to Steinstucken. He was going to go there one morning, uh, try to surprise the East German guards at the gate, count on the fact that they would recognize him, they would be intimidated by his persona and his presence, and would let him go through. But in order for that to work, the whole story had to be kept very secret. So he told people on the staff not to let the word get out. So he drives to the Steinstucken that morning. It's around six in the morning. And the mayor of the West Berlin community is there. The mayor's wife is there. A whole bunch of school kids are there. A whole bunch of reporters are there. And on the other side of the border, a whole bunch of East German border guards are there. So Clay is not going to drive to Steinstucken. But he still wants to get there. Well, and I'll tell you how he got there in just a second. But one of the reasons that this was in, that Steinstucken was still important for the Americans, uh, obviously we were concerned about morale dropping off in West Berlin. Specifically, we were concerned that young West Berliners and West Berlin businesses would not see Berlin as a place that could be viable after the Soviets and the East Germans had put up the Berlin Wall and that they would then abandon the city, move to West Germany, and West Berlin would become a shell of itself. Uh, it would become an embarrassment for the United States. Another important thing was the Americans at this time wanted West Germany to continue to support NATO, specifically to be willing, the, uh, to, uh, be willing to support having tr troops in NATO. West Germany had already re reconstituted its military and had troops in NATO, but now you, the Germans are not just providing economic support, they're providing critical on the ground uh, military support as well. So the Americans had to be concerned about that as well. All right, so Clay decides he wants to go visit Steinstucken to demonstrate American resolve. Fortunately for him, there was something called the Berlin Control Zone. So for those of you that remember the Berlin airlift, over on the left-hand side of this graphic, you'll see these three corridors here. These are the three corridors that, <clears throat> 
the Americans, British, and French used, or the Americans and British used to conduct the Berlin air clip, air, uh, airlift. These were corridors that the Soviets had approved of, and as a result, they really couldn't block them off without violating uh, four power agreements. And that's what enabled the Americans or the British to conduct the Berlin airlift. Well, they also agreed, the Soviets also agreed to a 20 mile radius zone around the city of Berlin, primarily for air traffic control. And the rationale was, I'm, I'm sure we've all been in aircraft where you're about ready to land at your destination, but you've got to circle the airport for a while waiting to actually have a, a landing slot. Well, the, West, the four power allies in 1945 realized that the American, British, French, and Russian air controllers were going to have those same problems when planes were coming in. And the Americans couldn't just have the American aircraft loiter over the American zone and the British over the British sector and the Soviets over the Soviet sector. They needed the air controllers, the four power air controllers, to be able to put those aircraft where they needed them. So what they did was they came up with this Berlin control zone. And what the Berlin control zone was from ground up to 10,000 feet, any of the low altitude aircraft of the four powers could fly without approval from any of the other powers. And that 20 kilometer radius included Steinstucken. And by this point, the Americans had helicopters in Berlin. So the date was September 22nd. I have to look it up. But the people in Steinstucken are out in their gardens in the morning. They hear, they hear helicopter blades. They look up. And this army helicopter lands and outstand steps Lucius Clay. He is instantly recognized. The people of Steinstucken swarm around him. They're relieved. They're thrilled. And Clay it, it, it greets them. You just see they just load them down with flowers. The family members took the opportunity to tour the helicopter. And Clay made a point of telling them and reassuring them that the Americans were going to continue to protect all sectors of West Berlin that they were responsible for, and that included Steinstucken. So what Clay did was he basically removed any doubt for anybody who was watching that the Americans were going to make an issue of Steinstucken. And if the Americans were going to protect Steinstucken, you could assume they were going to protect the rest of West Berlin. And this is a big morale boost for the people of West Berlin at a time that they sorely needed it. All right. Uh, this graphic that you're looking at here are the Steinstucken residents saying goodbye to General Clay, his helicopter's flying off. Uh, I put this in the book because it's pretty poignant. So these are Steinstucken residents here. And then off in the distance, about 50 yards away, you see a bunch of other people lined up. These are their neighbors from Babelsberg, people that they had they, that they had, uh, done neighborly things with for years. Now those neighbors, however, were trapped in East Germany. The Berlin Wall, the separation, officially went right here. So their neighbors that they've been friends with for years can only look on and watch while Clay is, is flying away. So if you want to sum up what the Cold War was like at the personal level, this graphic really does it. All right. So Clay was no fool. He recognized that uh, it's, it's, it's one thing to actually go out and fly to, St to Steinstuck, and it's another thing to really secure it. So the Americans decided to establish a military police detachment in Steinstuck, and they maintained that for 11 years. It was basically a boots on the ground presence. And the way that those uh, MPs went in and out is they went in and out by helicopter because they couldn't drive there. So for 11 years, uh, Berlin Brigade's MP company basically protected Steinstucken by serving as a tripwire. They were not heavily armed enough to resist any kind of serious Soviet or East German in in incursion, but the fact that they had boots on the ground was a way of emphasizing to everybody that America meant it when they, when they said they were gonna support Steinstucken. All right, so here are some pictures of the area around Steinstucken. The picture on the right was taken from Steinstucken, looking off, to Ber off in the distance toward uh, West Berlin. These are pictures of the death strip. That's the, that's the name of the strip that was cleared by the East Germans around West Berlin and later around Steinstucken. So this is the West Berlin side. This is the Steinstucken side. So anybody trying to escape from East Germany into Steinstucken uh, would have had to cross over this open terrain here. 
and then get through this fence and then get through this open train here and, 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 and this fencing here. Uh, and this picture was taken in the 1980s. Lots of dignitaries came to visit uh, Steinstück and it became a, a common uh, place for American uh, diplomats to come visit. Willie Brandt came to visit. And any time that, Amer that a, a dignitary came, it was a big deal for the people in the village, especially the children. So in this particular case, uh, you can see this American general uh, and uh, he, has, uh, he has an audience of young kids that are following him around as he does his tour. What would happen is the people that lived in Steinstücken, what they would generally do is they would walk up this wooden path about a kilometer or they'd ride their bikes and then they would go through a West German checkpoint. When they went back into Steinstücken from West Berlin, they'd go through the West German checkpoint and then two East German checkpoints. This uh, MP down here was watching some East German uh, soldiers while they were doing maintenance on the fence around Steinstücken. This gentleman here with the camera was a GDR photographer that was taking pictures of everybody that was part of the American party to include the American that was taking this picture. Uh, a minor detail here, you'll notice that the MP has his name tape covered over because they wanted to make it hard for the GDR to know the names of the American personnel that were in Steinstücken. All right. There was a real close bond between the military police company and the people of Steinstücken uh, during the 1960s. Berlin Brigade built a playset in the shape of a helicopter. And that playset is still there today. And it's maintained by the residents of Steinstücken. Uh, the MP company started a tradition. At, at first, they would actually fly Thanksgiving dinner into the Steinstücken exclave. And then later on, what they did was they, they uh, added to that by arranging to take the children of Steinstücken in army buses to um, the MP barracks for the traditional Thanksgiving dinner. And those of you that have been in the American military, especially overseas, you know that Thanksgiving is probably the biggest meal that a command will have in the year. It's a, it's a big deal. And they brought the children of Steinstück in there. And these pictures are from the Berlin Community Military Newspaper, which is still available free online. And uh, you see the kids having a good time there. Um, Apparently Santa Claus and the reindeer could not come into Berlin. So Santa, when he visited, he was brought in by Berlin Brigade. And this picture here is of the school bus that the West Berlin government provided to the residents of Berlin to get their children in and out. So a German, a Steinstücken resident would drive the bus. And there's one anecdote that I wanna share from you or with you about the bus here. And one of the things that I say is unique about the Steinstücken story is that it, it, it gives us a chance to look at how the Cold War impacted people on the personal level. I mean, we're, we're used to hearing stories of Kennedy versus Khrushchev and the United States versus the USSR. But what happens if you have a family and kids that have to go to school and to do that every day, they need to go through East German checkpoints and they need to have... Um, they need to be on East German control list in order to get in or out of their home, or you run the risk of being arrested if you step if you happen to cross over a particular line in your in your neighbor's field and that field happens to be Germany. One thing that I noticed in the Steinstücken residents told me is that nobody wanted Steinstücken to be a flashpoint. They wanted it to be a nice, quiet community that the Americans and the Soviets left alone. So what the Steinstückerners would do is they would do everything they can to keep good relations with the East German border guards. Lots of times that didn't work out, but there was this one episode that they told me about with the school bus here where the East German border guards got to know pretty much everybody who lived in Steinstücken. So when a car showed up, they would know if the person in the car actually lived there. So <clears throat> the school bus driver had relatives in West Berlin and she wanted to bring her nephew into that to their house one day and Stein took it just for a visit because the, ne the nephew wanted to visit. And he was high school age. So when the woman drove the uh, school bus into, St into West Berlin to pick up the kids from the, from the school to take them back to Stein took the high school age kid, she also picked up her nephew and just told him, okay, pretend you're a Stein took in resident. The bus pulls up to the East German border uh, checkpoint the East German border guard comes up, looks in the bus, points at the boy and says, okay, who's he? And the uh, bus driver said, 
well, he's a Steinstuck in resin. I'm just taking him home. And the border guard said, no, he's not. I know he's not a border resident. So just tell me what the deal is. And she explained and he said, okay, just make sure that you have him out of the, of the exclave before the next border, uh, before we have our next uh, uh, change here of border guards, because the next set of border guards may be a little more politically intense than my colleagues and I are. So go ahead and take him in there, but just make sure you have him out for the next border uh, shift change. And incidents like that happen in Steinstucken all the time. And people just learn how to get along. Steinstucken's isolation ended in 1972. Um, there was an agreement called the Four Power Agreement. It was one of the major uh, detente agreements between the United States, the Western powers and the Soviet Union, specifically designed to end tensions in Berlin. Uh, the Four Power Agreement did things like made it a lot easier for West Berliners to go and visit their relatives in East Germany, many of whom they had not seen since the wall went up. It also provided guarantees for civilian traffic to go back and forth between West Berlin and West Germany. And that's something that hadn't been in paper yet. And then as part of the four power agreement, East Germany sold a strip of land to West Berlin that connected Steinstucken and they built this road here. And so you had this new country road that led from West Berlin into Steinstucken and on both sides of it, you've got the Berlin Wall. And so these pictures are of the opening of the road to Steinstucken. And after that, Steinstucken became basically a West Berlin neighborhood. One of the unique things about Steinstucken is that the people in the, in the exclave really remembered what the Americans had done to help keep them safe. And so the Steinstuckeners uh, to this day maintain a strong tie uh, with American veterans that served there specifically uh, members of the Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment who made a special uh, effort in the late 1980s, early 1990s to rebuild ties between the American military community and the people of Steinstucken. So this is the commander of the Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment, then Major Doug Powell. This is the guidon of the Aviation Detachment. And you'll see this streamer there. This streamer was hand knitted by the people, by the ladies of Steinstucken for the Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment. And these pictures you see here are of <clears throat> uh, American participation in the German Summer Volk Fest. They brought a Huey helicopter out there, allowed the kids and the, and the residents to climb into it. And that tie between the people of Steinstucken is still pretty strong, all right? <clears throat> this is what Steinstucken looks like nowadays. Uh, Steinstucken has now pretty much been ab absorbed uh, into West Berlin because during the Cold War, there was a lot of open land around Steinstucken. Once Germany reunified, that land became prime uh, territory for construction. So now the little isolated village of Steinstucken is now just basically another suburb of West Berlin. But there are still strong pictures of the uh, reminders of the American presence there. This is a memorial that was put up to the helicopter airlift. Those are Huey rotor blades. And inside the uh, Steinstucken clubhouse, there are still lots of mementos from the Americans and also uh, mementos commemorating the Americans. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book, well, first, I wanted to write a, a book about a, a, a good subject, a useful subject, specifically one that I didn't want people to forget. And when I talked to the people in Steinstucken, they said, you know, a lot of us are passing away and we don't want these memories to be lost. So that's one of the main reasons that I wrote the book. Plus, it was also an interesting story. And uh, this is a connection that I hope that continues because uh, this is a really unique story, uh, an example of, of, of Germans that are still very grateful to us. And it's a story that I hope uh, people don't forget. All right. So uh, Eleanor, at this point, uh, I've been talking for about 39 minutes. So now would be a good time for me to uh, open up the floor to questions. All right, cool. Um, absolutely. Maybe what we can do is uh, if someone has a question, you can unmute and you can go back on, on <clears throat> video and uh, you can ask your questions. I do have one maybe to kick things off. Sure. I noticed you, that the pictures you had of Lucius Clay making the visit to Steinstucken, 
He was in civilian clothes. Right. He was. Why was? Time. Why was that? He had, he had been retired for a long time, so he went back as a. Uh, he didn't go back as a general. He went back as a civilian authority. Uh, interesting thing. He 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 wasn't. Um, Clay's authority wasn't exactly clear. Uh, so when he went there, he uh, he exercised a lot of authority as President Kennedy's representative. Like for example, uh, uh, at, he he was when he first got there, he started actually giving directions, orders to the Berlin Brigade, and that caused uh, some that caused some ruffled feathers amongst American uh, military and diplomatic officials in Germany because Clay was somebody who was outside the chain of command. Uh, but when he was when he went back there, he went back as a uh, as a civilian representative of uh, the president, his personal representative. Um, I, I have a, a oh, Elder, are you are you okay? Or can I ask a question? I'm ready. Go for it. Okay. Um, what I was wondering is, first of all, it was a fantastic uh, um, uh, display. It was it was really a great talk. Thank I you. Really appreciate that. Um, so do you think the Steinstucken was more of um, a Soviet run um, deal or was it mostly driven by the East Germans or I mean, because it, it, it's uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Uh, that, that, that's a, that, that is a fair question. So first off, I have not been able to explore the archives, the, the Russian archives, the East German archives or the West Berlin government archives. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something I hope to do in the future. I hope to write another version of this book if I can get some support, like maybe from a university or somebody, uh, <clears throat> because a lot of those documents now exist in the German federal archives and it'd just be a matter of, of looking them up and see exactly what the various governments on the, uh, the non-English speaking governments were saying. Uh, so the answer I'm gonna give you is what I, what I can piece together just by reading the tea leaves of what the Soviets and the East Germans were doing. The um, the Soviets want, were trying to apply pressure to get the Western powers to re rethink staying in Berlin, uh, to erode our will to stay there. And the Soviets always were looking for opportunities to test the Americans, especially. And I think what this was is this was an opportunity. And I think the East Germans wanted, the East Germans saw this little village as an irritant, and I can understand why. And it was also an embarrassment to them that you had this West, West Berlin village right in the middle of East German territory. And I think what happened is the, the East Germans basically said, let's try to take this village over and let's see what the Americans do. Let's see what the American response is. Maybe the Americans will offer to negotiate. Maybe the Americans will, will meet us halfway. Maybe the Americans won't care about the village at all. Let's see what happens. Uh, and I don't, I, I, from what I can, I'm guessing the Soviets said, okay, that's fine. Let's see what happens. Right. And right. then when uh, General Matthewson put his foot down and made it very publicly, made it clear publicly that he was not going to abandon the village, I think the Soviets went to the East Germans and said, we are not going to make an issue of this village. We're not going to start a shooting war over a bedroom community back off. That's what right. I think. And this, lastly, uh, how many um, how many folks from Steinstucken were you able to actually inter interview um, that are still- Most of them have passed away. In some right. cases, I, was able, I had to rely on their, uh, the, their memoirs, but I was able to interview three. And one of the issues is, is that uh, is, is language. There's still a few other Steinstucken residents there that, uh, that, that do not speak English and I don't speak German well enough, but I was able to interview you three. Okay. Well, again, thanks, for, thanks very much for a great presentation. Oh, thanks, I appreciate it. <clears throat> I have another question. You had made a comment um, that uh, about, you know, certainly this, this little village could have been just basically run over by the Soviets. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but was exactly. there infiltration at all um, that, that you've been able to uncover of the KGB at all? I mean, there had to have been, if it was so relatively easy to access this village, were there, you know, was there spy infiltration there? Um, or did they just- I, I, I asked the CIA if they had any information. And that they were, and they they politely replied that they had searched their records and there's nothing that they're willing to share. Uh, 
would, it would not surprise me if there were some American agents or Germans who are American agents uh, in Steinstucken, but that is not available in the records right now. Um, I don't know of any uh, Soviets or East Germans that infiltrated Steinstucken itself because you know, what would the point of that have been? It was basically a bedroom community. There was really nothing to learn from the people of Steinstucken. As far as I know, none of them had any kind of sensitive jobs uh, that uh, would have made them good targets for recruitment. Uh, one of the things that Steinstucken was noted for, especially when the Berlin Wall first went up, is that that was one of the places that at least initially, if you were in East German and you wanted to get out of East Germany, you could go to Steinstucken because the barbed wire fence wasn't very strong at first. And so for the first year or two, there were a fair number of East Germans that managed to get through that barbed wire fencing. And so what the American MPs would do is they had some extra MP uniforms and ponchos. And what they would do is they would cut the long hair of all the, uh, of, of all the, uh, the men and have the women put their hair up. And then they dress them in MP uniforms. And because they knew that the East Germans were watching anytime a helicopter landed and, and loaded or offloaded. And so what they would do is they would disguise them as well as they can. So it wouldn't be obvious exactly who was getting on the helicopter. Hmm. But wow. that was something that the MPs were pretty busy doing for the first few years until the East Germans strengthened the wire fence and then actually put up the concrete panels with the, um, with the concrete logs on top that we now think of when we think of the Berlin Wall. Right. Wow, amazing. Any other questions from the group? Please don't be shy. This is Terry, Eleanor, Mr. Smith. I think I could be wrong, but there was a slide that was missed just before the end labeled last flight out of Steinstrugan. Yeah. I had to cut, I had to go through a bunch of these slides because this is the, this, this is normally a longer presentation. But uh, this is actually, a, 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 I, I got a kick out of this story. This picture was taken uh, two days before Germany reunified. Germany reunified on October 1st, 1991. And so this was the, on September 29th, that was the last official visit by the American military to Steinstucken while it was still officially part of, of West Berlin and the American occupation sector. Because as of 1 October, the occupation would be over. And so they arranged a public relations event. They brought uh, the US Commandant of, of the Berlin Garrison out. They brought a member of the Berlin Senate out. And they brought a bunch of reporters out. And at, remember, at this time, the uh, Berlin Brigade Aviation Detachment had built a very close relationship with the people of Steinstuck and many of those folks are still friends today. And so uh, Major Powell, now current, retired Colonel Powell, told me that uh, they, the visit was over, they all got in their helicopters, they flew away, and Major Powell was part of the, the detachment and flying, and he re realized that the last helicopters leaving Steinstuck and last American helicopters had media in them. And that didn't sit right with him. So what happened was, is the helicopter, the, the uh, helicopters went back to uh, Templehof Air Force Base. They offloaded all the media, and then they flew back to Steinstucken and, and had one more flight through there, just so that they could say that officially the last people, Americans leaving the West Berlin exclave of Steinstucken were American military personnel. And that's what that picture is. Uh, it was an Air Force photographer who took a picture of that, that. That was the last official flight from occupied uh, uh, West Berlin. Thank you. It's a really cute, cute and touching story. Uh, good job. Okay. Hey, Donna, I have a question for you. Sure. Was, was, were the, uh, what was the safety record on the helicopters? Did any of them go down? Any, I'm just wondering how that would uh, pan out if it went down in Soviet territory. None, none, none that I know of uh, on the Steinstuck admissions, although I, it might be that, uh, uh, th that they just didn't tell me about that. I'm going to reshare my screen here. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, but uh, hold on. Can you all see me? Okay. Can you all see me? I can, I see, can you. see you. 
Yeah, we okay, can see can you, you but we can just. Okay, that's a key. Yeah. Yeah, no, we can hear you, but we just uh, have just your regular desktop screen, not the Okay, slides. well, okay, I'll bring the slides back up in a second. Okay. But, Major Powell is like is is, is a is is a his, historian of, of American military aviation operations in Berlin, and he said that there had there were some helicopters that crashed in um, uh, in East German territory, and that later on they applied some restrictions to using helicopters over its own in the Soviet sector. I don't know all the details of that. Uh, uh, but nothing in relation to Steinstuck. Mm. Okay, thanks. And those helicopters, again, were flying within those narrow areas that had been designated for um, multiple multiple occupying nations to fly, fly below 10,000 feet. Is that right? Uh, actually, they weren't flying. Well, they, were, they could fly anywhere from the center of Berlin, specifically... The Berlin Air Safety Center, which was part of the old Allied Contr uh, Control Authority building, mm -hmm. where they started measuring from, and so uh, and so they could fly anywhere within a twenty mile radius of that as long as they stayed below ten thousand feet. Okay. Now, one of the questions we I do get is, how did you end up in the situation where you had a neighborhood that was split into different chunks like that. And if, if you don't, I can take a second and explain that to you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you're trying to show slides, but only we're seeing is like a black screen. Yeah, same here. My, my screen has gone black here. So, uh, but at this point, y'all can hear me, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Go, let me just go ahead and tell you. So, Stan Stuken's status was re re really uh, the genesis of it, or what we're, we're it all started hundreds of years before the modern city of Berlin was created. And apparently it's not uncommon for farmers in Germany to farm multiple plots of land. And it's not uncommon for those plots to be separated by several kilometers. And so there was a farming uh, in uh, next to one of the main lakes in modern day Berlin, the Wannsee Lake. And some farmers in that village started acquiring some plots of land about three miles south. Oh, Don? Don, if you can hear me, I think we have lost you. I think your connection may be a little wonky. Oh, apologies. Don, can you hear you? Hear us? I can hear you. I know. I thought I'm okay, but <laughs> <laughs> looks like his screen is frozen as well. His, yeah. his image is frozen. Yeah. Yeah, we may we have lost him. I apologize for that. Uh, wow. No, this was this was interesting. I mean, I had no idea. Um Oh, I think we lost him. He may be trying to dial in. So we can give him a second to see if he dials back in. Yeah, yes. Eleanor, where's he uh, coming in from? Uh, I think he's in Arizona, if I recall. I know it's, let me think. He's two hours behind us. So he, he'd be mountain time. So he's he's not local. <laughs> I think I think now that I think about it, I think he is in like Tucson or or um, that vicinity. I apologize. I'm glad we were able to get through the presentation before before this happened. Let me try to text him very quickly. Yeah, he must be out there out there because his his area code looks like it's like Phoenix. Yeah, he lives in Tucson. That's what his bio says.
Oh, there he is. Okay. I think we're going to get him back. Hey, Don, we lost you there. <laughs> I know. Uh, Microsoft decided to restart my computer. Oh, that's that's always <laughs> thanks, Microsoft. Thanks. And, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I'm sure they did it for my own good. But uh, okay, uh, I'm back. So, shall I uh, shall I continue with the story of how Stein Stuken ended up in that situation? I'm game if, if the rest of everybody's game. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so where we last left off before Microsoft shut me down was uh, that. Farmers in this community were acquiring plots of land in an area that was about three miles to their south. And then as the uh, the decades passed, and actually as the centuries passed, eventually some people built some houses uh, on those plots of land. A little community grew up. And that community became Steinstucken. Steinstucken uh, in German means stone pieces. And the soil in the area was rocky. So that's how Steinstucken got its name, had rocky soil. Well. As the as the centuries went on, that larger farming community where the farmers actually lived was involved in you know, you know land swaps and consolidations and mer mergers and annexations, and but they always continued to treat Steinstucken legally as part of this other community. So in other words, the people that lived in Steinstucken paid uh, taxes to that uh, larger community. Their kids went to school there. And then in 1920, when the Prussian government created the city of Berlin, the, what we now know is the, the, the big, big major city of Berlin, um, the primary farming community became part of the city, but Steinstucken just happened to fall outside the outskirts by about a kilometer. And it was just kind of a quirk of, of, of fate. And Nobody really thought much of about it at the time because um, it was really only a, an administrative matter that came up like around tax time or when you had elections. I mean, the people in Steinstucken would vote in Berlin elections, but their neighbors would vote in Babelsberg or the city, state of Brandenburg elections. It really became an issue, though, during uh, the Cold War when Steinstucken was officially part of the American occupation sector. And so that's how Steinstucken ended up getting separated like that. Hmm. I have another question, uh, Eleanor, sure. Mr. Smith. Yeah. How um, did we provide anything else to the community besides security? I mean, did we feed them or clothe them or, you know, where did their water come from and so forth? That mostly came from East German utilities. So they were hooked into East German power, water, and they would then pay for that. Uh, I think they would actually pay the West Berlin government and then the West Berlin government would pay the East German government. Uh, and one of the unique things was is they paid in West Marks. And so uh, there were times when the, uh, when the power wasn't very good or the gas pressure wasn't very good. And the Steinstuckerners would use the fact that they were paying in West Marks, that they were paying in hard currency as justification for getting better service. And every so often that actually worked in their, in, in their favor. But they got, uh, they, they got their utilities from the East Germans until the road was built. And once the road was built in 1972, then the West Berlin government laid utility lines along the road. And that's in Steinstuck and then became part of the West Berlin utility grid. Wow. And did we provide anything? Did we feed them and so forth or not? No, we didn't need to. They were they had jobs in the city. Uh, they uh, they were economically sustaining. Uh, we did we now I'm sure they got some support from the West Berlin government for the simple fact that they are West Berlin citizens. But no, we didn't have to set up any feeding stations or anything like that. Um, we just provided the MPs. So it wasn't like the Berlin airlift again on a smaller scale. No, no, and as it's important to bear in mind it, it, to to note that for the most part, the East Germans did not prevent 
the uh, people of Steinstucken from going to and from uh, Berlin. So they could go shopping, they could go to work, and they ended up really living relatively normal lives despite the unique situation they were in. And when I visited Steinstucken in 1988 and we went there, it was like a little German neighborhood, just like the neighborhoods that all of us who were American servicemen lived in, because we lived on the economy, surrounded by the Berlin Wall. Thank you. Oh, I, I guess all the Berlin Wall and any um, resemblance to that has all disappeared today. Yeah, my understanding is that all that's gone. Matter of fact, they started, uh, of course, like with like with anybody in uh, West Berlin, they started tearing that wall down as soon as they could. And very quickly, or relatively quickly, the East German border guards stopped patching the wall. At some point, initially, they were patching the wall when holes got chipped in it, but then they just gave up on that too. So, uh, yeah, I... I um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm, maybe they have a small section of the wall there, but if anything, it's, it's not something very big. That's uh, uh, people I know that have gone back to Steinstuck and said they had to look around for traces of the wall. Yeah, it's a shame to say that it's all been absorbed in it with urban development. Well, it was prime land. And, uh, and so if you look at the pictures of Steinstuck and before and after, you can see where there's a lot of fresh construction right around the edges of, yeah. of the village. Very great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed doing it. And this was great. Well, hopefully, uh, if you get that uh, part two written, we can have you back to talk about your new research. I, I, I'll be glad to come back and, and, and talk about it. There's also more about Steinstuck and I can talk about it if you'd like. Uh, but one thing I did want to talk about is, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and bring my slides up. Yeah. Uh, these are the, some of the resources that I recommend for people who are interested not only in Steinstucken, but also just learning about the American occupation of Berlin, especially the early years. Uh, and, and the nice thing about this is the things that I'm looking at here, only two of them actually would cost you any money. Uh, the first one, uh, Steinstucken, A Study in Cold War Politics, that was a book that was written by a... Uh, an American academic who spent some time in Berlin, and he actually got to know people in Steinstück, and he spent some time there. I relied on this book heavily, and it covers basically the period from when the Americans went into Steinstück and up to about 1967, 1968. Hmm. Uh, that book is still available in Amazon, although it's out of print. Uh, there is a brand new book called Checkmate in Berlin by Giles Milton. And it talks about the first five years of the Allied presence in Berlin. And uh, that's some of the things that I cover in my book. I talk a little bit about why I say one of the reasons Steinstucken was important is that Berlin was important to the Western Allies. So I wanted to explain why uh, Berlin was important. And one of the reasons it was important, it was the site of many Cold War victories. And one of the early Cold War victories the Americans achieved was getting the West Berliners to support them. And uh, in the early stages of, of the, or in, the, in the early years of the occupation and Checkmate in Berlin talks a fair amount about that. It's a really good book. Hmm. Uh, the City Becomes a Symbol by two, uh, uh, by two historians at the US Army Center for Military History. You can buy the book or it is a free download. It's a free PDF download. That's how I got it. Uh, another source that is free is the Germany Under Reconstruction Collection on the University of Wisconsin's digital library site. Somebody once asked me, did I have to go to Germany to do any research for the book? I didn't because so much of the information that, was, that I needed was in this collection. And it's all free of charge, it's all public domain, and it's wonderful information about basically the period from 1945 to 1955, the first 10 years of the American presence in Berlin and Germany. Next up is Ger Germany Country Reader, the Association of Diplomatic Studies and Training. If you are not hooked in with them, I strongly recommend you become hooked in with them. They are an organization that supports the State Department in terms of training and also keeping records of things that State Department people have done. And they put together country readers where they go and they interview State Department personnel 
that have worked in various countries. And so the Germany country reader is free of charge. It's over a thousand pages and I downloaded it and relied on it heavily. Uh, the Berlin Observer is was the is was the American military community newspaper uh, during the time that the, Amer that the Americans had a presence in Berlin. And it is online now at the BerlinObserver.com. And you can download those issues uh, free of charge. I relied heavily on that. And this is the uh, logo of the, East Ber of the uh, Berlin Observer. Uh, lastly, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. If, if, if you're not familiar with this organization, you might wanna check it out because they have been created by and chartered by the German and the Berlin government to keep alive the memory of the American Berlin connection that was developed during the Cold War. And they're gonna be assisting uh, with helping me uh, promote the book and also tell the story of Steinstucken. But there's somebody you should consider supporting because they're trying to keep alive the memory of the good things the Americans did in Berlin. All right, you know that I have a book that's available. It's on Amazon. Um, if you want to learn more about the Stein Stuckin story, I have a website, steinpocket.com is the website. Uh, if you want to email me directly, that is my email address. Uh, now, one thing I wasn't able to get worked out before we had the presentation, but uh, my publisher, Acclaim Press, that is their website there, and that's their customer service contact information there. If you, are, if you order the book and call them and say that you're a member of the Southeast Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society, what they will do is they will take 10% of the purchase price and they will donate that back to the society. So they'll keep a record. And then once all the books are sold, they will cut a, a check to the Southeast Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. Um, you can also order the book online at acclaimpress.com. There is a code that I'm supposed to get that you can put in your order. And so if you want to do the order online and get the 10% do the donation, you can do that as well. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, uh, Eleanor, I didn't get that information from the publisher before we uh, had this presentation. But as soon as I have that, I'll email it to you. Okay. But for somebody that does not have the book yet, and if you would like to order it, if you uh, email Acclaim Press at that email address or call them, and just tell them that you're part of the Southeast Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. When they place the order, they will set aside 10% of the purchase price to go back to the society. And the, otherwise, you can, if you, or if you want, you can just order it on Amazon. Just type in the name of it. Now, the name of the book is Stein Stucken, A Little Pocket of Freedom. That can be kind of a mouthful to type in the Amazon website. So if you just type in the, the word Stein, S-T-E-I-N, and then the letter is S-T, page will pop up. Or you can also type in a little pocket of freedom, and that'll pop up too. Actually, uh, uh, looks like Amazon is out of the books. You should take a look there. I know. We, we, wow. We have, yeah. yeah, we have, they just put in another big order. Fantastic, yeah. I guess they got some really good responses. So what we're asking people to do is to go ahead and order because as soon as the books arrive and they have been shipped from the publisher to Amazon, as soon as they arrive, Amazon will fill those orders. So we are, uh, we're asking people to go ahead. If you want to order through Amazon, you know, please go ahead and do that. And it just it should be a matter of days before the books arrive and then they can fill those orders. Now there's one favor I'd like to ask is that as an author, I'm told that your book much better on Amazon if people write reviews of it on Amazon. So for those of you that get a copy of the book, uh, please go ahead and give it a review and just, just tell, it, tell me exactly how you feel about it. I mean, good, bad, or ugly. But if you get the book, uh, and especially if you like it, one way that you can help the book do well is to go and write a review for it on Amazon. And... Um, that's all that I have right now. I have some other presentations coming up in the future. Uh, for anybody that uh, is in the Southern Kentucky, Tennessee area, I'm gonna be at the Southern Kentucky Book Fest in Bowling, Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is in between Lex Louisville and Nashville. Uh, I'm gonna be there on March 26th. And 
I guess that's it for right now. But I uh, I love doing this. As you can tell, I had a, you can, I, I'm sure you can tell I had a great time doing this presentation. I like telling the story of Steinstucken. So if you know of any other organizations that would like a Zoom presentation, uh, please ask them to check me out. And uh, Eleanor, that's all I have to say right now. I will stick on for questions, but I know I've talked for a good bit. Uh, so what are the questions y'all have for me? No, this was this was great. I, you know, thanks again. I was also just going to suggest, have you reached out to the Air Force Museum for presentation? No, no because, because this really wasn't an Air Force mission. This was more of an Army aviation mission. Um, so I really don't see the tie into the Air Force there. The only, the real tie though for the Air Force is that uh, I think a lot of people know who Gail Halverson was. He was mm -hmm. an Air Force pilot who dropped candy and parachutes to the Berlin children. He's known as the candy bomber. And uh, he has a tie to Steinstucken because he was commander of Tempelhof Air Force Base when the road opened up. And one of the Steinstucken residents as a child had caught a candy parachute and had kept it and asked um, uh, Colonel Halverson to go out there. So he went to visit and he uh, actually built up a pretty good relation with the people of Steinstucken. Oh, wow. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're gonna gonna call it an evening and wrap up. No, no questions from me. This is look. I'm in WA, West Australia, and this has been totally awesome. Thank you for your time, Don. I really appreciated it, and thank you, Eleanor, as well. Uh, I'm gonna sign off now. All right. Have a good day. Thanks so much. Thanks, no everybody. Mr. Skelton, thank you. I appreciate it. I see it. Thank you. Yep. This was great. And uh, please join us next month um, on March 10th. Um, our speaker actually is going to be talking about the Brewster Aeronautical Corporation. Um, we actually had him speak back when we were doing live programming at the Fuge, but uh, his presentation was, was really terrific. And I wanted to have him back to regale uh, a new audience with uh, stories of that real, real uh, crazy story. <laughs> from uh, Warminster before the Naval Air Development Center took over that property. So again, March 10th, uh, same time, same channel. So thanks once again, and Don, thanks again. This was fantastic. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing this unique story about the Cold War this evening. It was my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone. And uh, hope to see you next month.